So you are in for a real treat this evening. I'm blessed to be able to welcome uh, Anna uh, Fiegenbaum, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly, I should have checked beforehand, uh, to <laughs> Virtual Futures. My name is Luke Robert Mason, I'm the director of, of Virtual Futures, and for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, and the charismatic profits was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series, and it, and it now has been a series, completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by Anna. She's the senior lecturer in the Faculty of Media and Communication at Bournemouth University. Her work has appeared in Vice, The Atlantic, Al Jazeera America, The Guardian, Salon, Financial Times, Open Democracy, New Internationalists, and Waging Nonviolence. Her new book, Tear Gas from Verso, deals with the ways in which toxic gas has been employed by governments to control riots, used by individuals for self-defense, and leveraged by police forces to disperse crowds. Tear gas, also known as CS gas, is widely used in, uh, incapacit as an incapacitant spray. It causes immense burning sensation in the throat and nose, but beyond that, the effect on uh, beyond the effect on the body, it is also designed to have an impact on the mind. It is ultimately designed and meant to demoralize those who it is used on. As Anna notes, it provides full sensory torture, and it is sold with those benefits. It is marketed as being both painful and yet harmless. Although those claims are to some degree disputed, in fact today uh, toxicology data is extremely limited. The long-term effects of using tear gas on an individual isn't yet understood, and as such, much of the research is actually military-based and therefore protected. So to help us understand the problematic politics of this non-lethal weapon, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Anna to the Virtual Futures stage. So, Anna, you've dedicated years of your life to the research into tear gas. I suppose the question is, why? That's always a good question. Um, and I wish I had a slightly more uh, media-friendly answer for it, but um, the reality is that I had just completed my first kind of joint authored book on protest camps, and we were putting the images together. And uh, I found in flipping through all these images that went back to the 1930s that tear gas had been used to evict these protest camps. So people assembled in squares and public spaces, staying over in protest. Uh, and tear gas was the go-to to clear them out when the state had enough of having the people there. And I hadn't realized when I looked at this, these images from uh, the Bonus Army encampment in 1932, I just hadn't realized that tear gas was that old. And I was on a postdoc, and when you're on a postdoc, you have a lot of time, and time, of course, as an academic is the most precious commodity and it was probably like 2 a.m. because I also was like in you know some small decrepit grad student sort of house and I started googling where tear gas came from and I found out within the next kind of hour that there were very few answers to that question and I thought how can we have this thing that has been used to destroy and dissipate protest for nearly a hundred years and nobody's ever really written a history of it. Well, could you tell us some of those key historical moments in the life of tear gas? So it's, it's gone from war to peacetime, from weapon to product. So one of those key historical moments in the life of that, I suppose, product or, or non-lethal weapon. I think the first one, or where you kind of uh, get first taken on this, on this journey through Google, um, is into the trenches of the First World War. Uh, and it was... Thought, it's thought that tear gas actually started to be kind of tinkered with before the First World War by the French, possibly in response to all of the barricading that had happened um, in the kind of French resistance before that. But it's really in the trenches that we start to see it used on a kind of, you know, 
larger scale and that we actually have documentation of its use. And so the reason that that happened was because, um, as many people know, trench warfare caused a kind of stalemate where people were hiding in the trenches, staying in the trenches, and this meant that people couldn't advance and kill each other. And if you can't advance and kill each other, then what kind of war are you having? Uh, and so they needed ways to get people out of the trenches in order to be able to advance uh, slash kill people. So they they found that if they, or they thought up that if they had, could use this kind of gas that would disorient people and kind of psychologically terrorize them and make them panic, that they would be able to get them out of the trenches, at which point they could either fire more poisonous gases or, or artillery at them. And so it was used in a kind of experimental manner in order to kind of destroy the stalemate of trench warfare. Of course, it was very early chemical development at that stage, didn't work that well, did a lot of um, what's called blowback, where it just would blow back into the faces of the people who were firing it. Uh, and so it wasn't really thought of as a, as a fantastic military development at the time. But then when the war ended, some very entrepreneurial chemists that had been involved in the First World War started to think about how they could create peacetime markets, what they would call peacetime uses of, of both tear gas and other kinds of war gases that had emerged at that time. And this is already from the beginning a very kind of financial as well as kind of political move. So for example, in the United States, 10% of all chemists were enlisted into the First World War. This includes major chemical companies like DuPont. Huge amounts of money are going into this industry. And so when the war ends, they want to keep this new boom in the chemical industry going. And so this one general in particular, Ms. Fries, has this idea of, hmm, what would happen if we took tear gas and we tried to manufacture it for law enforcement? And he took, borrowed samples from the military lab, and he donated those samples for research purposes to his kind of buddies, his war buddies, um, who'd retired from uh, the military and had gone on to open what were the very first tear gas manufacturing plants in the United States, some of which still exist today. Well, you also say in the book that the origin of tear gas is some way associated with colonialism. And in fact, you say that colonialism and capitalism are intertwined at the heart of control technologies such as tear gas. Could you explain exactly what you, you mean by that? Mm, sure. So those kind of early uses that we saw in the United States in the 1920s were largely to break up labor protests and labor strikes. And that was really its kind of initial use. And that those uses were being documented in newsletters and they were being circulated around the world. And one of the places, of course, that they were being circulated to was the British Empire. Because at the same time, we're starting to see the rise of independent movements in the colonies, particularly the Indian independence movement, which is one of the major kinds of uh, troublesome um, things that was happening for the British Empire um, that needed a response. And particularly in the case with India, where a lot of eyes were on it, particularly after the Armistar massacre, where hundreds of people were just shot. Um, and it caused a kind of public relations nightmare, an international relations nightmare for the British Empire. And so that really was this kind of trigger of needing another kind of solution for these rising independence movements. I mean, of course, the British Empire also used much more violent tactics, but certainly on the kind of PR, PR face of it, they needed this other alternative. And so if you actually look both at the Indian independence movement as well as those that were happening in Nigeria and Rhodesia and Palestine, you know, there's all kinds of reasons for independence movements, but a large reason for the desire to continue colonization is, of course, financial and economic. And a lot of that resistance was people, you know, refusing to work, people going on strikes, kind of labor demonstrations. And so if we really have to understand tear gas and its use or this consideration of its use during by the British Empire in the colonies, not just as a way of the Britain, you know, randomly maintaining control over so social population, but you know, like slavery, uh, being able to continue that financial gain from having your workers work. And tear gas was an excellent solution because you don't want to kill your workers; you just want to quell their protests. Well, let's talk a little bit about more about tear gas itself. So it doesn't kill. It it Quos, uh, quashes their wor workers, as you were saying there. Could you just uh, describe what is tear gas? I mean, you describe it so uh, beautifully in the book, but could you uh, give us a little more information as to, to what makes up tear gas and, of course, why it's called tear gas? Sure. Um, so tear gas does sometimes kill. So that's the first thing we always yeah. want to be clear on. Is we'll that get there this in is a second. yes? This is, <laughs> so we'll pause. We'll pause on the lethal, less lethal. Um, so 
The first thing that we need to know is that tear gas isn't a gas at all. It's actually a kind of teeny fog or droplet. And what makes us think that it's a gas is because it's usually released with other chemicals that create that smoke. And what makes us see that smoke is because if you're a photojournalist and you're trying to take a picture of a protest, if you can capture those moments where that smoke is thick, you've got a beautiful image and you've got an image that instantly signifies protest riot. And so that's become our kind of semiotic, our, our symbol of what tear gas is and what, what a protest is, but it's actually the chemicals that are the irritants are not visible in that way. Uh, it got given the gas part of its name largely because it, it it's easier to think of a gas as this kind of cloud or this thing that, that sort of dissipates through and moves through space. It got called the tear part of the gas because they were worried that if they gave it a name that actually signified what its real effects are, nausea, asphyxiation, stampede gas, doesn't have quite the same sort of marketing ability. And so they sort of settled on tear, everyone cries, our soap opera, you know, it's this kind of thing that just everyone does, and then and then they, it's ephemeral. You just you know you brush them off, you you just take a little tissue and it's gone. And so they this was kind of what made um, them them come up with this nomenclature for it. Well, you, you touched on it briefly there, but in what way has tear gas become so important to the iconogra uh, iconography of protest itself? Why is why is that image of tear gas so important for photojournalists to capture? Well, I think from a kind of police PR point of view, the moment that you have tear gas, you've turned any kind of peaceful demonstration into the image of a riot. And that, of course, also works to kind of criminalize the protest or to cre create a scene of chaos. And up until a threshold, creating that scene of chaos is definitely in the interest of the state and in the interest of law enforcement. Of course, that, some, that threshold sometimes gets tipped over where then the state and the police get blamed for having caused too much chaos. Uh -huh. There's a weird feedback loop that seems to be occurring there because to protect yourself from tear gas, you have to look like a quote unquote rioter, don't you? Yeah, so if you want to go out, uh, as many people do, with your handkerchief or your um, gas mask in order to preempt the, what's going to happen with the tear gas, then you instantly become that bad protester, that criminalized protester, that member of the black bloc who is there to incite the police. And that serves as a justification for the police to then use the violence in defense of the aggressive protester. So, so is there a degree to which tear gas is doubly effective, both from both from a functional perspective and also an aesthetic perspective because it turns protesters into rioters, both on the ground because of the effects of the, of the, um, the gaseous uh, material, but also the image and iconography that occurs there once it, yes. it's in your eyes, it's yeah. in your face, it's in your nose. Completely, and I think that's why in addition to kind of looking at that entanglement of colonialism and histories of capitalism and understanding tear gas, we also have to look at public relations. And it's not a coincidence that tear gas becomes a commodity in the 1920s during the Edward Bernays rise of PR. They're the first kind of marketing of tear gas is happening using these Bernays style PR stunts. They're taking a bunch of police officers, there's this famous one in Philly, where they take a bunch of police officers into a field, they set off a bunch of tear gas canisters, they invite all these journalists to come and document it, and they create this scene of uh, of the, the amazing effects that the protests have as the police officers are running scared and scampering away. And that idea that you would demonstrate the effectiveness through these public relations stunts continues to be the way that tear gas is largely marketed if you look at the kind of arms trade of this as a technology. And so it's kind of colonialism, capitalism, and of course public relations, which often sits at that intersection as well. Well, let's talk a little bit more about how tear gas is now marketed because they're very proud of the fact that it doesn't cause harm and yet it's hyper effective. How is the marketing of tear gas as a material? What is the language that surrounds the marketing of tear gas? I suppose is the question I'm asking. Yeah, well, this that, that's also something that has kind of evolved over time. So whereas in the 1920s, there was not really any pushback against saying things like, you know, a poison gas to get the protesters or, you know, will cause mob to stampede. Basically, the advertisements in the 1920s, when you look at the archives, say, this will be a huge PR win for your police department. You should put this poison gas on people. 
And then that changes, of course, over time as there's pushback, particularly as they're trying to make this international marketing because a lot of European countries uh, in, in the, do not want to call it poison gas, do not want to be talking about it in these kinds of very American kind of gung-ho cowboy language. And so we start to see that kind of civilizing, benevolent uh, British sort of rhetoric uh, come, come to rename uh, the ways and re-kind re of advertise the ways that, that tear gas is being marketed. And so then by the time you get into the kind of uh, 1960s, you've got a slightly different sort of language around it. And then today you have this incredibly, you know, kind of uh, almost humanitarian, you know, kind of ill Weissman stuff around this sort of less, lesser evil and this almost human, this way in which it's made into this kind of humanitarian agent um, that's, that's pacifying and that's benevolent and so forth. So we see that change over time. Uh -huh. you, you talk specifically in the book about how non-lethal weapons are sold around this idea of escalation of force. You know, you, you can buy these for your, your beginner's kit and then you can go all the way up to stuff like plastic bullets and stuff that really will hurt and really will cause trouble. Why do you think that language has become so pervasive in the way in which the police have sold their um, utility, their, their, the items that allow them to do their jobs? Yeah, I mean, I think the greatest example of this is a company called, this Brazilian company called Condor Non-Lethal. And what they've actually done is they've taken the UN basic principles of force, which were kind of agreed in the 1990s, about having, using the appropriate weapon for the appropriate uh, amount of, of force that you need in that moment. Now, of course, in the UN Charter, it says you're only supposed to use any of these less lethal weapons if your life is under serious threat. But in the arms trade version, you get a different weapon. They actually have a little cycle, and at each level of the cycle of the escalation of force, they market a certain little set of products, and then the little products are like, you know, escalate around this. And so, you know, in, in a very basic kind of advertising firm, you'd say, yeah, that makes sense. Just like we want, you know, each of our Apple devices for each of our different Apple needs, our Apple Watch, our Apple tablet, our iPhone, our MacBook, right, right? We need each one because they each serve as a different thing. And then isn't it great how they're all integrated and interconnected and they talk to each other all the time? And this is the same logic in which these uh, less lethal technologies are being used. This becomes really clear when we look at a company like Taser or rebranded Axon because tasers kill people. Uh, which is actually, there's actually like a, the, the gun itself records, so the Taser electric fire gun, records data, feeds that data into their database system. They run something called evidence.com, which manages all their data. They also are now doing facial recognition. So they also, because they do the body cams, so the body cams recognize the face, it goes into the database, and so forth. And so this kind of complete digital integration of both the less lethal technologies with other kinds of police surveillance is kind of where we're at right now with this. Well, with your research, did you spend some time on the floor of those sorts of fairs, those those weapons fairs, those non-lethal weapons fairs? And, and what sort of language were you seeing? Because that sounds like selling cloud services. You know, we'll, we'll take all your data and we'll, we'll process it for you and we'll, we'll sell you both the weapon, the recording device and the database all on the back end. It, it sounds like you're selling it like it's selling any other t form of that, that, software and, package yeah, or technology. Yeah, that is exactly how it's done. And, you know, the interesting thing about, so I've been going to um, arms fairs for about 10 years now, and the interesting thing about them is that there are moments where you're looking in one direction and you could just be at any kind of computer tech fair, and then you turn around and there's a bunch of machine guns that you can pick up and, you know, play with or whatever, like go into the shooting range or like see the, see the drone exhibit in the corner or like climb into this tank and get your photo taken, right? So it's this incredible mix of, of the, the mundane and, and the deadly. And of course, what fairs do is completely sanitize the, the humanity out of the sale of, of these products, right? And that's something the arms, arms trade is very good at. And of course, they're also, um, depending on how rich and how, how successful the, the um, company is in its stall, you either get like some tap water or like a really fancy Italian espresso machine when they like serve you champagne and make you like a little espresso and you just like drink your espresso while you're discussing like which kind of completely repressive technology you, you would like your government to purchase. Who do you go as? Do you go as... <laughs> no, no, no. But, but, but now I, I, I see there's a whole sort of guerrilla performance opportunity here, but do you go as lecturer from Bournemouth University? I do, Or yes. do you go... Oh, that's such a shame. I know. <laughs> 
I do, do you want me to be like secret Saudi princess or something crazy? Uh, no? no, but right. I will I will say that there are not a lot of women at these events. All right, okay. Um, and I do have, if anyone's planning to go, I do I do have a guide um, for how to, one um, thinks about their gender performativity on, in either direction um, a, a, as a means of of navigating of navigating the fair. At this one, I actually both felt a man's bicep and had my own bicep felt, uh, and then found out a lot of um, illegal deals that were going on um, in the Middle East. So, you know, it depends. You gotta draw li your limits. That's about mine. That was about my bodily limit. So but, as, as, yeah. a, as a academic, as a researcher, I mean, dealing with those, uh, the understanding of those ethically problematic deals that are going on, I mean, how does that, feed back into research for books like this? I mean, how do you come to that point whereby you know you have to publish a book like this? What stays in, what gets left out from how you deal with finding out the information yourself? I mean, what is the ethical line you yeah. draw personally? I mean, as a methodology, I think of it as participant observation. So I'm not, right, okay. I'm not formally interviewing them. They don't need to give me consent for that. I won't take quotes from things that people tell me. I think of it more in a journalistic sense as a lead. So until you find actual evidence, that's not a thing that you can publish. You know, so you need to find a paper trail, you need to find confirmation. You know, with some of the companies, they're interested in their own PR and they, they actually will engage in a dialogue with you. Um, also, a lot of them just, you know, these, these aren't major missiles companies, you know, these aren't, they're not selling, you know, drones that are firing missiles in, in, in Yemen, you know, they're, they're selling aerosol tear gas can. So a lot of them will just talk to you, like they just, the, the scale at which this is, is just entirely different. And also their turnover is entirely different, it costs like $25 to buy a tear gas canister, you know, we're not talking about these massive, So this is FMCG you know, of, of fares, you know, this is, this is. The, the bigger Smaller things consumer goods, the you can fair, have it yeah, in your hand tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. almost like it, re relatively right. speaking, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, I definitely na find the ethical navigation of it quite difficult. And we, we've started to train younger researchers into going to the fairs as well. And it's, it's could, definitely been Could you mind. tell me a little bit more about that training? So we had recently um, a Jack Quee who's working with putting his students in on the um, production line for the Apple iPhones. Mm -hmm. And he's doing certain degrees of training to allow his students to go into those environments and deal with being in those environments. Could you tell me a little bit more about the training that you do to enable your students to navigate those sorts of fairs and those sorts of places? Yeah, I mean, kind of formally with my university hat on, like we put people through hostile environment training um, and all kinds of risk assessment and ethical clearance before anyone goes out and does field yeah. research. Um, in a kind of um, journalist, and that's also because you know I'm in a wonderful journalism school that thinks about these things in a way that a lot of other departments don't, you know. Um, and then with kind of a journalistic hat on, we we talk a lot about these kinds of things around boundaries and limits because, of course, one of the complicated things about being a journalist is that you're supposed to be friendly or buddy up, or you're supposed to kind of to solicit information. You are supposed to act a certain way that a researcher doesn't does not really. And that there's definitely a tension that exists being a journalist researcher um, that we're, we kind of try to help them um, navigate. And a lot of it is like we were saying before, of like what can you actually record, what, what actually goes in uh, and, and doesn't, and, and that a lot of it. So that's work that happens in advance of doing the research as well as after doing the research. And I think a really important thing for while you're doing the research, you know, sometimes it's the case that someone has to go out by themselves, but we do things like check-ins. So... Um, if it's uh, like a PhD student, they have to check in with you like every week or every few days to make sure they're okay. Um, I think whenever possible, people should be going in groups to these things, the amount of emo emotional support and emotional decompression that you need. Um, and using a lot of the resources that journalists have been producing on vicarious trauma. Uh, and so, you know, it can be something as simple as, you know, go for a walk after, or um, we, this time we went climbing after the arms fair. And, you know, just like get yourself into a different environment, like get, get out of that tension of that zone. Because of course, when you go into that kind of character and that kind of space, it can be really easy to lose your own kind of humanity and sense of self. So you advise they create a degree of character or performance when they enter these environments? I think, I mean, you know, we're always a character performing, but um, I, th I think that there's no way to navigate or survive those spaces without 
a kind of pr sense of awareness, self-awareness and, and performativity. And also, you know, if, and this is true for any industry, if you're going to a major networking event, you research the people you're going to talk to in advance. You often find out kind of little topics of conversation you can bring up with them. You know, if you're, if you're doing that kind of work, like that's always going to be somewhat performative because networking is always a performance of a certain version of ourselves. Have you had any specific responses from either the sellers or the buyers of tear gas to your book? Um, I got, so I have, I have this uh, uh, long distance email relationship with an Eastern European police trainer. Um, and he, he first emailed me, I guess, after reading an early kind of newspaper piece I did in the very beginning of the project. And he sent me this beautiful email that I ended up putting in the book um, about how he wished there were alternatives and he had long struggled with the fact that, that, that it felt like everyone always just went to riot control right away and didn't think through things like uh, different kinds of conversational tactics and de-escalation tactics. Um, and he subsequently has done a PhD on alternative tactics to uh, police use of force. And he just sent me an email this week um, saying that he had gotten the book, he had seen uh, that I had quoted his email and he was very touched that I thought it was important enough to put in and then sent me a link to his PhD which is written in a language I do not read. Um, <laughs> but I am going to follow up on that and see, see if someone are. can. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that is true. Um, yeah, and he is writing a review of my book for to send out to policing uh, industry uh, papers. So, um, so that's may, one. There may, are others. Maybe but. uses a degree of their, their training going forward, perhaps. Let me, let me ask you then about what you think the future of non-lethal weaponry could potentially be. So you're talking about your your pen pal who has some ideas, well, pen pal, email pal, um, who has some ideas about what this could look like, but are there alternatives to things like tear gas? I mean, the real problem in this area is that if you're talking on this kind of police reform policy level, it's very difficult to not end up in this bind of like, but everything else is more dangerous. Yeah. Or then we're just saying, okay, just try to not shoot people in the face with the tear gas canisters, right? We're always kind of mitigating around. And this is, I'm very, you know, drawn to Alex Vitale's, you know, new work that says, you know, there's basically, there's no such thing as police reform. Like we, we need to completely abolish and rethink this very idea. Um, but that's not a, a po an immediate policy solution to stop people dying immediately, right? Which, which me and Alex talk about quite a lot. Like it doesn't, that doesn't mean, like the reality of the situation is to answer that question, we would need to unearth what it even means to have police and to have law enforcement and how we regulate communities. But in the immediacy, what would we do? Yes, we would have the UN princi basic principles of force actually be followed. We would have international regulation of the trade in tear gas. So one of the major problems right now is that uh, a lot of companies, particularly in Korea and in China, are much less regulated, just like with other kinds of products, than um, some of the more US or European exporters. And so you have uh, lots and lots of tear gas and all kinds of different gases and other kinds of riot control weapons being exported to countries that also have very unregulated police forces and then them being used in ways that are just complete, completely outside of safety protocols, even, even the safety protocols that are actually printed onto the, pro the products themselves. And so you have things that you can definitely do to decrease the use of tear gas, to decrease the harmful use and dangerous use of tear gas, um, and that, that, that are a more kind of immediate response. Right now, what are the boundary conditions for usage? So from a, without going into the kind of nitty gritty of this, what are the legal conditions under which you can escalate to the use of tear gas? It really depends. So each different country has different kinds of jurisdictions that make different kinds of rules for what their law enforcement can do. In general, and this is a huge generalization, um, you would need to be under some kind of threat, some kind of physical threat and feel like, or a major property threat, like they were gonna burn down a building. So most of the uses that, of tear gas that we see, those conditions are not met. And if you looked at UN basic principles of force and when you're supposed to use it, if, but the problem is that that's not actually, you know, you're like supposed to follow things the UN says, but like, you know, there's no real regulatory body behind that. But it, most of the uses that we see would be completely in violation of that. Um, so the reality of use versus the kind of policy that's supposed to be guiding use, there's a major gap in between. If we, if we take a step back for a second, I mean, how did we see, or how did we 
it comes to a point where we're having this remilitarization of European cities. I mean, at what point did this tip back to seeing folks with with guns on the streets? There's there's an artist who's who's still his work still I think in in the UK, uh, Danny Plojer, who's looking specifically at at how weapons are being used. The AK-47 as as a symbol of weaponry is being used in places like the Ukraine. Um, and very westernized cities, Berlin, we see the hyper-militarization of the police. They, they wear the gun rather than use the gun. And in fact, to a large degree, uh, they say that their ability to use the gun is diminished because they're wearing it so much. They're kind of, their, their reaction time is, is reduced. I mean, when did we start seeing this again? And, and why do you think? Was it 9-11 or is it, was there something at play before then? to put um, sort of the remilitarization of these spaces yeah, into I mean, play? I think there's various moments in history where we start to see this. I think it's important for, to understand the current kind of post 9-11 uh, push in military transfer and military technologies as, as having at its origin at least as far back as the 1960s. Because it's at that point where what starts to happen after the kind of massive pro global protests, in the, in the, particularly in the late 60s, um, you know, that we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of, uh, where riot control manuals that were written for the military start to be translated into a language for the police. They start to, to, to actually start to teach formation lines, showing, showing force, so doing things like having your weapons out outside of your, your kit so that people can see it, and with this idea that showing the force will help. Um, this uh, idea of fight or flight that's very big in the kind of military psychology of post-World War II um, starts to enter into policing, uh, and you actually literally have new introductions to the same books that are circulated in the military saying, now there's a market for this for the police. And then they rewrite the forward to the book. And then they do these like case studies of uh, times that the use of kind of more militaristic techniques worked effectively. Um, and then they do these kinds of case studies and put them into these manuals. So through the 70s, as we start to see the police, heavy policing of Northern Ireland, which of course is this kind of hybridization of military and law enforcement tactics, Northern Ireland becomes this kind of testing ground, this, this training ground, this teachable moment um, for other police departments around the world of how we can use military tactics to quell a kind of massive um, uprising. And then again, in the first intifada in Palestine in the 1980s, again, we see a new case study emerge of how, again, with this hybridized police force, we can have this kind of, kind of use. So I think we need to be tracing these moments where we see a hybridization of military and policing, things like National Guard in the U.S. context. Um, as, and there's a kind of trajectory then that we see of this. And of course, post 9-11, we get that language of synergy of these departments needing to share with each other massive funding opportunities that are coming up for ways that military police and things like fire and rescue can be working all together. And so that has an origin that, that can be traced back farther. Can we talk a little bit more about how you have traced those moments? So your, uh, your work is, is really a work of digital storytelling to a large degree and it's a, it's a work of the digital humanities and as, as Versa shared with us when when they were uh, sharing this book with us for Virtual Futures they said look there's something very interesting at play that's happening underlying her study of this object tear gas and it's a process of how you're tracing the history and tracing those moments from a methodolo methodological perspective. Could you just explain a little bit more about what you've done over the last couple of years that have given rise to this, this publication, given rise to this book? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. I never get asked that question. Um, so yeah. So when I give this talk, when I talk about the tear gas stuff with my digital storytelling hat on, uh -huh. so I mean, the, the most basic answer is that I don't think this book would have been possible to write before you could do things like fancy keyword searching. Like the ways in which I was able to move through archive categories looking for a single term through documents made possible bringing together all the different kinds of things that I'm bringing into conversation with each other. Things like Google patents where you can click on a link and go back and back and back and back through patent documentation. Like that is an incredible resource for technology scholars. You know, and then being able to link that with the names and moving all around. So these really basic kind of tools that kind of anyone can do without all that much training of, of key advanced Google keyword searching. 
And then uh, we also started to, I've trained myself and gone to trainings and all kinds of things around this. Things that I found really valuable are basics and kind of data scraping, data visualization. So one of the things that we have been doing is um, setting up, and again, super basic, setting up Google Media Alerts, and then we were mapping incidences of tear gas onto, uh, I mean, the first year we did it terribly using Google Maps, but then once we learned what we were doing, uh, thank you, Matt Ellis, um, you, we made a spreadsheet, we put them in, we got the coordinates, um, we learned how to use QGIS, which is an open source GIS platform, so it's free to use, great tutorials, um, and Carto, which was better before than it is now, but it also has a free version, and we would map um, onto, onto Carto after doing the coordination through QGIS. Uh, and so that allowed us to all of a sudden have this, this visualization of the places tear gas were being used in a year, um, an archive of all of these stories. We then, well, my research, wonderful research assistants, um, then coded all of these incidences of tear gas for me so we could know what the incidences were, what kinds of spaces they were being used in. So we were kind of doing a mashup of kind of really basic g critical GIS from geography with um, media content analysis, which is a really common practice in media studies. And, and those two things together were like a really fantastic synthesis. Um, and then we also have done, been doing some mild scraping. We're using a wonderful tool that no longer exists called import.io, or at least doesn't exist in a good form anymore. Um, but there's probably other things that are similar, and it's like kind of baby um, click and click and post like to, to scrape off of websites. So we would use that for things like going onto an exhibition catalog, scraping all of the exhibitors of less lethal weapons, and, and automatically getting them generated into a spreadsheet, which lets you monitor the companies. Um, you're doing that with things like LinkedIn and other kinds of CV sites so that you're taking information about the different kinds of players and then using social network graphing, um, wonderful tool called Kumu. Uh, there's also Graph Commons, which is fantastic. Um, Power Maps from Little Sis, which is fantastic, that all do this kind of thing where you can like import data and you can make links between companies and people and start to see those connections emerge. Uh, and so we've done some of that. Um, so they're kind of like data storytelling 101, um, kind of power mapping sort of, sort of techniques. Um, oh, one of the other things that's also super useful if you do this kind of research, we went through a bunch of humanitarian, like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch's backlog, because the ways that those are stored is thankfully digitized PDFs, but there's no like database that centralizes the kind of findings in, in all these humanitarian reports. So we would use the PDFs and do some basic kind of word scraping in order to pull incidences and link incidences together. And so thinking about the history of humanitarian reports as a kind of data mine of uh, documentation of, of, of social justices and injustices um, as well. But it, it sounds like the one thing you could do was mapping the usage of tear gas. But one thing that you say is still very, very difficult is the medical studies on tear gas and the medical consensus around tear gas mm -hmm. and how that's been formed. I mean, how through some of those methodologies did you try and get a better understanding of the medical impact of, on individuals or the long-term impact on individuals of tear gas. You, you've teased early on that there's been deaths caused by this non-lethal yeah. weapon. We have this wonderful, if, any, if anybody uh, knows anyone who wants to fund this project, we have this wonderful idea for a project of creating um, a less lethal deaths database. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and actually trying to, to because it's totally do it's a totally doable digital humanities project that just needs funding, um, where you would scrape through medical studies, humanitarian reports, news articles, and actually try to get a sense in this in the way that people are doing for um, you know police killings in the U.S. Try to get a sense of how many people have actually died. Um, with medical studies, uh, one of the uh, major problems in, in kind of medical field is that you have lots of different studies from lots of different kind of medical perspectives, and then the data, the, the data is really, really scattered. So then people do these kinds of lit review type studies or, or fancy statistical multivariant type studies, but, but in this area, much more likely it's a lit review. And then they try to, they read like 200 articles scattered around on, you know, previous people writing about tear gases. I just reviewed one on um, impact munitions. Um, and there's like a whole system for how you do this in medical research. Um, and then that's like the closest that we get. But the problem is everything is anonymized and 
because of the rules around what kinds of patient data you can record. Um, you don't, you have very limited and kind of patchy pieces of information. Often you don't have a lot of demographic information. And of course, when someone's coming in because they've been injured, usually in a protest or in a, in a house raid, first of all, if they come into the hospital at all in those situations, which is really rare, they're not exactly there wanting to give all their personal information, you know, especially in countries where, um, which is which is all countries, um, where you, you can actually be, you know, come out, people can come after you in the hospital um, and you can be arrested in a hospital and so forth. So it's incredibly messy as a medical th uh, thing to study. And the funding is, of course, in the military, uh, the medicalized military side of it, not in I, I want to study the number of people whose eyes have been shot out in the past year, you know. Well, one potential way around that that you talk about is is the use of testimony and how testimony can be not used so much as as quantitative data but as qualitative data that can put pressure on certain organizations to make these sorts of studies public and i just wonder what is the uh, use of citizen science in this sort of realm yeah i mean this is really where at least we've seen a potential for us to make the, the most impact. And so one of the projects that, that we run called Riot ID, which is something that we do with a group NGO called Bahrain Watch and an NGO called the Mega Research Foundation and our wonderful graphic designers, MinuteWorks, who also did all the illustrations in the book. Uh, and it's we call it a civic forensics project. And the idea is to try and train people how to know how to identify and monitor these weapons. So we do kinds of deconstructions of what the different kinds of equipment looks like, what the different kinds of equipment do, um, what makes it a use more and less dangerous, what parts of the body they affect, and so forth, and using kind of infographic uh, forms um, in order to try and um, create kind of training, participatory training manuals um, to help people do this. So these are currently used um, by, by Omega at trainings um, with the UN, with other kinds of human rights monitor, um, watchers and monitors. Uh, and so we just got a little bit more funding to hopefully expand that project um, a little bit. It's translated into eight languages. If anyone speaks any of the languages not already translated, we're always looking for translators. Uh, and that that's, and, and then, so one of the ways in which that works is that people, um, if they, see, if they see an object, they don't know what it is, or they see an injury, they don't know how to understand it. Um, they get in touch with us with, with like an, an image or a description, and we, um, using a kind of humanitarian database that we have, um, we, we try and do those kinds of identifications uh, and, and try and match up kind of what's going on. That's, of course, as you were saying, a kind of citizen science project in that the, the, way, the amount of detail that we're able to record and the amount that we can promise accuracy or validity is usually way below the threshold that you would need in a kind of legal, um, <laughs> illegal, legal case. It gets closer when we actually do, when tra trainings or Omega actually does trainings with people who are, uh, you know, more, more already well-versed in those kinds of humanitarian witnessing and how you turn testimony into... Um, uh, evidence into into legal evidence, um, and one of the things that we're going to work on with this new pot of funding and some help from my colleagues is uh, training manuals for journalists. So that's one of the big problems that when journalists report on this, they'll say something like, "I think tear gas, several people, you know, or rubber bullet, but really they mean birdshot, and all these kinds of uh, n lack of nuance that then means when you're trying to use that journalistic record, which is often the only record that there is." you've got completely inaccurate information. And there's actually some pretty easy switches um, that, that are easy kind of training that the journalists could have that would really improve their ability to kind of more accurately be depicting things that then, again, probably couldn't hold up as legal evidence, but could at least give us some sense of what, what's happening, be, be, being able to kind of monitor in a, in a more detailed way. Now, Riot ID, as I understand it, was launched at Banksy's Dismal Land. It was, thanks to Gavin Grindon. <laughs> could, could you explain a little bit more uh, about that launch and, and your collaboration with the artist, but also just how Riot ID has been used in the wild? Have you seen any wonderful case studies already come back from how this has been deployed out in processed environments or out in the wild? Yeah, I mean, occasionally we'll get a, a, a tweet from somebody who's seen it up somewhere. So it's been on the wall in, in the occupied territories. Um, it's been used in demonstrations there. Um, we've seen, uh, yeah, we've seen images of it from Turkey. We've seen, uh, we know that it's being used. We circulate it 
um, quite widely in Brazil and Venezuela. So you'll you'll get kind of a sense that that it's that it's moving a little bit, but it's it's a very nascent kind of um, project still. So we'll we'll see. And how was it used at, at Banksy's Dismal Land? How, how was it used in an artistic context in that case? Yeah, it was part of I think the activist tent. I'm I'm looking at the curator. I'm looking at the curator <laughs> for help. Um, yeah, so it was uh, it was out in a kind of activist tent where the same place that you, the um, that ad hacking that great ad hacking tool was, so you could where you could open the bus shelter ads and and put it there. So kind of it was kind of part of that, and then um, I guess was linked to the cruel designs. Yeah. Exhibition, yeah? Yeah. yeah. It was kind of thematically linked and it was on the website as well, so people could find it. Yes, yeah, so we call it the moment that we were mistaken for Banksy. Um, yeah, yeah. My students like this when I tell this. I'd like to tell the story this way because uh, the BBC uh, published the picture of the, of the image and said, you know, artist Banksy releases <laughs> weapons guide, um, you know, ahead of Desi Arms Fair because that's what we timed the launch for, along with some other posters that some excellent uh, graphic artists had done. Um, yeah. That the, the time I was Banksy. That's what Wonderful. Like so we, we have some time for audience questions. Um, we're recording this as a live podcast, so I do ask if you just wait until you get the microphone to ask your question. If you hold it about here, we should be fine with audio recording. And if you could let us know who you are, that would be wonderful to find out too. So does anybody have any burning questions? There we go. Of course. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm Nuri. Um, since you just uh, published the book, uh, I'm curious, is there any parts or case study or the evidence or um, the story that you wanted to put but you had to get out because of the editing process that you wanted to share with us tonight? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I guess one of the things that kind of happened towards the end of writing the book was I started... Uh, speaking a lot more with, and also through um, through Gavin's work, um, with uh, Cali's migrant solidarity workers uh, that were doing a lot of monitoring of uh, the uses of, of tear gas and other riot control in Calais. And I don't know if that made the book at all um, because of timing. So I've written a little bit about that and I'm, I'm writing another paper on that. Um, and, I'm in, and in general, this kind of way in which, so I'm working on a little paper side kind of paper right now about um, less lethals as border control. So the ways in which in places like Calais and in other kinds of fortress Europe borders, um, where there are not, where the, where the security systems are very ad hoc, where there's, uh, you know, they've been kind of, and where the border itself is just like a field, um, they're using riot control and, and particularly tear gas and flashbangs and things like this as a form of border control. Um, and this is of course highly dangerous um, because you often have things like a kind of ad hoc fenced in territory and then you've got all people like talk about completely nonviolent and like uh, it, it sets of sets of people you know you've got these children lined up against these fences and you're tear, you're like tear gassing them and like shooting them with things and they can't kind of get out of this space and we're also seeing increased uses in detention centers increased uses in 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 every in all of these kinds of spaces that are are linked to the kind of migrant crisis which is dealt with through and among other things less lethal so that's something that um, in addition to like the use in prisons more generally that that I would have liked to do to go into more detail on yeah Adam yeah hey I'm Adam um, it occurs to me as I listen to you speak I'm almost grateful for the fact that tear gas still exists as a riot control agent um, because it implies that there's still the possibility that an enraged multitude can contest public space. And as I listen to you talk about technological advancements, you know, I, I don't know to what degree you're probably following the Chinese social control stuff, the social credit stuff. The idea that technology is moving in a direction that preempts, predicts, anticipates, and preempts the possibility for us to even contest public space. Um, and that sort of undercuts our ability to, to protest things at a lower level um, is something that I, I find deeply worrisome. I'm wondering if you could speak to the, I don't want to call them upsides, but the, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the fortunate things about still being able to engage physically in a world where that might not always be an option. I think that will be, I mean, I think uh, 
what we really need is a lot of tracing of these two things together. And I keep arguing with my data friends about this. I'm like, we need the street to understand the streets and the algorithms, and we need to understand how these things are working together. And so if we see the goal of preemptive and, and uh, policing and surveillance, which largely the UK is what the UK uses, as one of its goals being to not to 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 dissuade or physically prevent people from even assembling in the public space. Um, then what happens when they do assemble in that, in that public space? Do, what, what are the tactics that police are using? How do we trace out how much preemptive stuff was used to um, what happened? So if you look at something like 2010, I think 2010, G20 Toronto, um, where you really have a heavy use of both our kind of traditional riot control and very strong police surveillance and preemptive tactics. And you know, you, how, what are the synergies and the, and the obstacles for law enforcement to use these things together? Um, how are they creating technological systems to try and use them together? And Axon is, of course, who we need to be watching with all eyes um, in this. So just for example, on the, on the Axon case, you know, lots of people are talking about body-worn cameras and lots of people are talking um, about their facial recognition and their databases. But of course, there need to be incidences on the street for these things to even be recorded. So it's not like we just have floating data about people that isn't being created through street-based interactions. And so a video just got um, circulated out of France, some of you might have seen, of a man catching on fire because he was tased at the same time that someone sprayed him with um, an aerosol CS, which is flammable. Um, and of course, this is a very, it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a video that we've seen so many times before of a young black man uh, saying, what are you going to do? Shoot me, shoot me, you know, and them beating and shooting him. Uh, and this is ca caught on body-worn camera, um, but then not released at the time, and then released, so this happened in 2013 and was only just released. Um, and so that points to what the other, something we have really need to be paying attention about, which is what is happening with body-worn camera footage. Who has rights to it? Who's seen it? What are they doing with it? You know, you see almost this completely parallel kind of discussion where body-worn cameras are being, f were, were being framed as, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pleasing the activists, we're giving them the sous surveillance, we're giving them this ability to, of accountability that they're asking for. You know, they use Black Lives Matters to, to, to justify and legitimate the, this massive rollout of body-worn cameras. Uh, but then if you're reading, as I do, all the police blogs and all the police newsletters, the, the police are doing it so that they have control over the image and over the story. Mm -hmm. like the, they train people, there are trainings happening basically every day on how police officers should use this footage, on how to tell the narrative, on how to keep the footage under control. You know, like, we, like on what planet are, is this for the people, right? Um, and so, but of course the incident, what we're worried about is the actual incidences that they're, of abuse that they're recording, right? Uh, not just the fact that they're creating a database out of it. So that's a kind of wrap around to your question, but I think it's like, we need to understand the interplay and the interrelationship between these kinds of forces and not, not see what I think is happening too much right now is that, oh, now we're talking about data and surveillance and we're not talking about this. And it's like th these things are not, are not disconnected, you know? Uh, and what will probably be the test um, will be whether or not that preemptive form of surveillance and policing uh, is enough to keep people out of the squares. And if they're going to be in the squares, what is that going to look like? And can, can, it, can it look like what it's looked like before? Or will it have to look like something new? Catherine. Um, I actually think there's some really positive uh, body cam uh, body worn camera policies in the U.S. Of course, the, the, they're they're in populations that um, are perhaps middle class and white, and so are very like privacy aware, so are very demand like demanding. But I think that that if you know techno if you know a lot of people would be against their use whatsoever. But if we're you know if it's going to happen anyway, I think there are some positive police forces to look at um, who are implementing the technology. I mean, then we get into the court system and all that training that needs to be done. Um, but anyway, my name is Catherine. Thank you very much for uh, the talk. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, I was really fascinated by what you said about the change of marketing that took place um, with the tear gas and how it moved into um, the humanitarian aspects um, 
more recently. And um, I'm really fascinated and have done lots of work with both surveillance technologies and now more lethal weapons um, regarding these cultural aspects, um, specifically related to gender and sex. Um, and I'm wondering if you've noticed any of these things regarding the marketing of um, tear gas. And also I'm wondering if you've ever been tear gassed. <laughs> okay. Um, so on, one last thing. So on body worn cameras, there's a wonderful project in the U.S. called body, the Body Worn Camera Score Sheet that that is monitoring all the different policies in place, yeah. and that's a great project. Um, like with any technology, the problem is not the camera itself. The problem is who controls it, who's using it, what's it shaping, what's happening. With and the, the training, with, like I mean, yeah. the the money that was sent for it was very much a band aid for the Black Lives. Oh, we'll just you know, like anything, like it sounds like tear gas as well. Let's just throw money at it and technology, and not actually give them any sort of training. Um, yeah. So yeah, and training is its whole own. You know, you could write a history of training. Someone maybe has, but probably not. Um, so on gender, uh, one of the big things that happened during the British Empire is kind of colonial push out. Um, so in addition to being faced by the problem of passive resistance, so there's, there's these two problems that get circulated in this memo that goes all around all the kind of colonial administrators in the British Empire uh, in, the, in the kind of early 1930s, um, naming the two problems that they're facing. And the one problem is passive resistance, particularly coming out of kind of Gandhian approaches to um, independence movement. And the second is what they call the woman problem. Um, largely arising around Nigeria's women's war, um, which had women at the front line of, um, of, of, of protests that were about uh, gendered uh, kind of issues. Um, and they could, didn't want, you know, again, this kind of PR thing of like, well, we can't just shoot the women, so we need something more gentle um, for women. Uh, and so you definitely had, at, at that moment, a complete sort of, g gender was a huge deal. In, in thinking about this, right? Which is also why, you know, the the image that we so often see when we see the tear gas is, is of a brown man, right? And the image, and that's not, that's the, where we're supposed to understand why tear gas is being used. And when we're supposed to see tear gas as unjust, it's like the woman in the red dress, right? Or it's it's a crying old lady out of Portland, if anyone remembers that image. Uh, and so completely, it's completely gendered, racialized, you know, classed, um, the ways in which these, these the, that kind of logic works. Um, what is the other, one other thing about gender that, oh, the other thing that happens that's very gendered that I talk about a little bit in the book is when, in the 90s, for example, when the police are justifying why all police need to carry aerosol, um, CS, or pepper spray, it's one of the justifications that they use is because, uh, you know, women need to be able to defend, the women police officers need to be able to defend themselves. And there's this case of this, like, pretty young British police officer who gets beaten by some thugs, and if she had had CS she would have been able to defend herself against the thugs. Of course, they trial CS gas and they find that like none of that has any kind of actual like empirical grounding. Uh, but in, this, in the way we see often in the military as well, with that women, women soldiers, women police officers, are, and their victimization is used as a justification for more heavily arming everyone. Um, so that's, I think, a very important gendered story as well. I have actually managed to never be tear gas in a protest situation, which seems impossible considering how many times I have been in a place where that shouldn't have been happening. So I've only been tear gassed in handling tear gas <laughs> and not in the research for this book <laughs> um, and not actually while running, while running from police. I, I was um, invited to go to, on Friday to the occupied territory so that I could be guaranteed a tear gassing, um, but I have not done that yet. How did you tear gas yourself by hand? Was it the, accident or purely a no, yeah, like part of your research? There's right, always, right. yeah, like there's there's always kind of chemical remnants and stuff in the thing. So when you're handling it, you tend to just kind of douse yourself in the in the face, which is a bit of a problem with our civic forensics. Everyone should handle the tear gas and send us a photo of it. You know, kind of kind of project that we're that we're <laughs> working out the niggles with. All right. Any other questions at all? Just to the back here. Thank you very much, uh, I'm Britta. My question was, uh, coming back to the storytelling and narrative aspect, so you said there was a big push in renaming a tear gas, and my question would be, what would be, so coming from an, an opposite position, what would be a good name for us to, to counteract this argument and give it a name that fulfills it, its purpose better? Mm, that's a great question. Um, and one I've never been asked. I always love getting asked a new question. Um, 
one of the things that some people who make our like are are in the kind of chem chemical weapons convention world, like policy world, one of the things that they're really trying to push for is to get it to be called a chemical weapon and for us to talk about it like as a poison gas or as a chemical weapon. Um, I think that is quite effective. Like chemical weapon canister, chemical weapon grenade um, is a fairly effective. And one of the really scary things that happens even at the level of policy, so I got sent some images um, from it's very complicated, but basically a meeting that was happening at a very important policy, international chemical weapons convention uh, event. Um, and the people who are in charge of like this being a policy put up slides to differentiate uh, tear gas from things like serin and, and, and the, the gases we should be really worried about, where they just put a picture of someone chopping onions and was like, and I'm sure for the people who have been tear gassed in scary situations in this room, like you would not say it's the same as chopping some onions for dinner. Um, so, so like that's terrifying that, that like people who are kind of in the upper echelons of monitoring our chemical weapons convention uh, make, make a joke out of, you know, the situation. So yeah, so I think I'm partial to the, to the chemical weapon renaming or, you know, honest naming. Any other questions at all? No, no burning questions, no burning eyes. That's a, that's a good thing. So look, my final question, I suppose, would would be about resistance to these non-lethal weapons. Obviously, there's there's positivity associated with the fact that at least these are being used and not anything more lethal. Um, are we? Is there any possible resistance to to non-lethal weapons? Are we doomed to criminalise ourselves with masks and gas masks when we enter these sorts of situations? Is there any way we can have a critical engagement with the sorts of tools that are being used on mass protests and protesters. Yeah, I mean, the the take that I kind of end with in the book is that uh, for that kind of level of sort of more activist or campaign-oriented intervention, I think that it has to be at the level of of funding and of of the corporate the corporate companies that are involved with this. I, th I think that either with a kind of what, what's called the low-hanging fruit strategy, where you look at some of these companies, so for example, Safariland uh, Group, which is a major police supplier uh, of all kinds of different policing equipment, and the guy, uh, Warren Kanders, who I talk about in the book, who also who, who owns this company, also is on the board of the Whitney Museum of Art. He also is the CEO of Black Diamond, which is a major sort of outdoorsy, uh, climbing, mountaineering uh, brand. You go after those kinds of brands, those kinds of links, those kinds of connections, uh, you expose them and you try and weaken that kind of kind of corporate power and kind of really, again, with like the renaming, you positioning riot control weapons as part of the arms trade and using arms trade tactics, uh, arms trade resistance tactics, you know, against them. Um, I think that because these companies are subject to PR pressure, because shipments get stopped when people protest, um, they get stopped sometimes by uh, workers, by dock workers uh, who refuse to fill out uh, an order. They get stopped by governments when there's enough pressure, you know, from things like Amnesty or coalition, usually coalitions that Amnesty, um, you know, is the brand, brand we recognize on, um, you know, they, have, they really stop these, these trades. Usually some other company comes and fills it through a back door or, you know, two months later that shipment gets through. But if you up that kind of activism, I think there are interventions that can be made there. Um, it gets harder when you break it down to the level of the street itself. I think you, you do end up, uh, you know, I think some of the things that happened in Occupy Gezi, which were these really creative ways of using and thinking about gas masks, so the kind of gas mask dancers, um, I, I don't know the traditional name for it, but they wore these big skirts and these big gas masks and they would do these kinds of dances around the street. And so you had this kind of, um, in the same way that we've gotten with kind of que queer resistance on the street and you know pink blocks and so forth, of this kind of turning or queering of the kind of resistant masculine in a gas mask uh, image in order to, to kind of, interrupt or refuse that sort of no dominant story or media story or police story of, of what it means to wear the gas mask that was really effective. There was also um, Toxin Man, or to no, Talcid, Talcid Man, like the thing you spray um, to, there's this idea that, that if you spray this kind of mix of uh, like, a, I don't know, actually, is it mallet? It's like a, 
is it like Pepto Bismol? Is it like Maalox. like Maalox, yeah. Maalox, yeah, yeah. Um, mixed with like water and you spray it. It's supposed to like reduce the effects. This is not scientifically proven, but so psychologically it seems to help people. But anyway, it, as a beautiful kind of act of solidarity, he had he wore he wore like this tank of it on his back and like went through the street like with it, distributing it to people. Um, and so there's all these beautiful kind of capturing of the of that um, act of solidarity. And so I think there's also these ways that we that that. In the same way that you know, whenever we're taking kind of uh, creative disobedience into into the street, we always get something that can be a little bit disruptive or challenging. We we do like ending virtual futures on the idea that we can have creative disobedience. So on that note, I want to thank the Library Club for hosting us. You're, you're at Library Club London. Um, we've been working with this venue for about a year now, and we. We're going to continue a collaboration with them throughout 2018. We use three or four of their spaces um, in here, and we're blessed to have their uh, support. I also want to thank uh, Catherine for her help tonight with filming. We're, we're scrappy, as you can kind of tell, so <laughs> we're kind of calling everybody to help us out. And uh, uh, books are available. Books are available from the back from Verso um, if you haven't uh, haven't got Anna's book just yet. And if you like what you uh, what you see and what we're trying to do at Virtual Futures, uh, please support us in whatever way, shape or form you can. We have a Patreon, but more important to me is is folks who want to collaborate with us. So we're always looking for new moderators. We're always willing to, to give Virtual Futures as a platform in, in a very creative common sense to anybody who wants to host a discussion on whatever interest or book that they have, providing it's within science and technology. We're not big on like weird women's fiction or something. It's a science and technology uh, group that we're, we're kind of running uh, here. And our next event is on uh, Tuesday the 30th. It's on biohacked bodies. And that's over in Brick Lane with folks who are putting chips into their bodies. And I want to end with this, which is how we end every single virtual futures. And it's with a warning. And it's the warning that the future is always virtual. And some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and in those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please join me in thanking the incredible Anna. The bar is now open. Thank you.